So, so thrilled to be with you guys. I'm so grateful that you're spending time with, with uh, me today and with one another. It was about uh, six years ago that my good friend Max Yoder contacted me out of the blue and he just said, hey Barry, I have a friend that's working on something I think you might be able to help. And I said, sure, great. And I ended up meeting Rita Troyer for coffee over at Thirsty Scholar. You guys remember Thirsty Scholar? Rest in peace, Thirsty Scholar. <laughs> and she, she told me all about Creative Mornings. I knew nothing about it. I'd never even heard of it. And I didn't know if it was just like a book club or a coffee clutch or this. I had no idea it was this. And it was uh, her enthusiasm that really sold me. I mean, I was, I was committed to helping her immediately. It wasn't really a hard, hard ask. So we formed the organization that, uh, that hosts this event, CM Indianapolis Inc. And then we went for 501c3 nonprofit status immediately thereafter and got it. By the way, almost none of these affiliate chapters have 501c3 nonprofit status, but this one does. And I got to see Rita build this from absolutely nothing into something from day one, and it was so beautiful. And if it couldn't get any better for me on a personal basis, when Rita wanted to move on to California to pursue some new opportunities, she passed the baton to a good friend of mine in Brittany, who you just heard from. And Brittany did a hell of a job for two years. It was so cool to watch her just continue this great tradition that Rita had started. And as if it couldn't get better, when Brittany's time ended, she passed the baton to another really good friend of mine. And Ryan Hunley. So I've been, I've been an advisor in each step of the way, but better still, I've been an advisor to three really good friends of mine. And I'd like, I, I know we've sort of applauded a number of times for what Creative Mornings is and does and the people, but first, I want you guys to give yourselves a round of applause. Not just, yeah, we'll do this in like one round of applause. <laughs> give yourselves a round of applause for being here and showing up every month and delivering to Indianapolis a community that you can rely on. A community of people that are open-minded, that are here to learn and engage. That's really special and it's not very common. So you guys deserve some credit. Of course, the volunteers that, that help every, every one of these requires a pretty large amount of man hours. And, and uh, because of that, it requires a number of people to volunteer their time and energy to make this happen. So they deserve a lot of our kudos as well. And then of course, this would not be happening if it weren't for Ryan, Brittany, and Rita, who each step of the way have led us to these great events time and again. A thunderous round of applause, please, for all of us. You know, the other, uh, the other special thing for me is where we are at, the speakeasy. Julie, of course, told you about this place, but for me, it's a special second home. I started uh, my law firm in 2011. In 2012, I came in to, uh, to interview with Denver, which was intimidating. If you knew Denver, she was, uh, she was hard to read uh, when you came in to interview for membership here. She, for whatever the reason, admitted me, and I spent a good five years as, as uh, a constant presence here, usually in that corner. I invented the speakeasy within the speakeasy, which no longer exists. That's actually just uh, what we call where we house the alcohol. And it was like in these cabinets that don't long, no longer exist. But um, I, I mean, the speakeasy offered me this, again, incredible community that my firm ultimately came to just love. Uh, I made so many friendships here and um, just still continually love this place. And Julie does a hell of a job. So I'm so, so thrilled to be here. Um, so when you're a lawyer um, and people ask you to speak, often they are unsure what you're talking about, but they have some ideas in mind. So I thought it'd be good to first talk about what we're not talking about, okay? First, the law. <laughs> we're not talking about the law today. I love talking about the law. We can talk afterwards if you like, but we're not talking about the law. We're also not talking about being a lawyer. Do you know why? Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares what it's like to be a lawyer. We're also not talking about the TV show Lost. 
Who here watched the TV show Lost? A uh, pretty healthy number. I liked the show Lost for two seasons, or three seasons anyway. Definitely went off the rails. But for like two or three seasons, it was golden. I'll posit this, this is really just a joke for the Lost fans. Let's suppose today is just as sort of it has started this morning with one big difference. What if instead of holding it here at the speakeasy, we hold it at the hatch? We have to talk about Lost for like two hours. Now, my friends, I thought long and hard whether I needed to do that joke, and I committed to it because I was like, it's clever enough that for the one-tenth of the audience that will understand it, they'll appreciate that a lot. All right, so um, we're obviously gonna talk about loss, but we're gonna do uh, one other thing too, which is I'm gonna share a lot of my photographs. So uh, we often, and this is actually something Ryan and I discussed, and it's mainly his idea, and I'm just straight up borrowing it. Um, it's this idea that we often just identify with our profession, you know, I'm, I'm, you know we're just a, a lawyer or a doctor or a marketer or a designer, and in fact we're much more complicated than that. We have so many more things that we're interested in and that we care about. And for me, it's photography. I love photography, and I may just as soon say that I'm a photographer as much as I am a lawyer. Um, so I'm gonna share my photographs, and I'm certainly not trying to hide the ball when I tell you that the photographs are really meant to uh, share the tone of what we might be talking about. I don't know how well I'm gonna hit the mark, but that's the goal, so hopefully it works. I will tell you though, this is my promise to you. I won't do any, um, I won't do any cheap tricks with the photography. All right, and here's what I mean. I could easily just show you pictures of my kids, and you'd find them probably really endearing, and you'd like me more, but I promise I won't do that. I think that's actually beneath me. And they're, they're really adorable. L and Teddy, two and four years old, they're just, I mean, they're photogenic too. But I promise to you, this is my solemn obligation not to do that, guys, so. Are you still out there? Good enough. Okay. So. When, when Ryan told me it was, uh, loss was the theme, I, first of all, I was really happy because as I was telling to Steve back there, uh, Tinker Steve, that is, uh, you gotta, let, you gotta let him know where they're, you know, which Steve it is. Um, sometimes the theme has absolutely nothing to do with the person talking. There's like the person from the utility company talking about like the water supply and the theme is like magic. It's like, <laughs> good luck. And it, it won't work. But, but everyone can identify with lost. Lost is this universal feeling. And so I started thinking about what lost meant to me. And I started thinking of, of two kinds of lost. There's the, the sort of obvious one. There's the obvious one, which is you're hiking on a trail. It's like maybe it's supposed to be trail number three. And you look up, and the markings clearly indicate you're on trail five. And you're like, oh shit, I am lost. I gotta get back to trail three. We've all been there. Probably been there twice this week. But then, I thought, there is the loss that you only realize in hindsight. It's the loss you sense in looking back and saying, oh, you know what? I've been lost, and maybe I've been lost for a long time. And so I'm going to share my experience with that feeling and how I think it's changed my life. By the way, if you want to talk about any of these photographs later, happy to do it. So I'm 39 now. When I was 29, I started really giving a lot of thought to how things were going with my life. And I always did this. I was really reflective and probably self-critical still to today, but at the time, I was thinking about like, all right, what's the vision for who I am? What does that look like? And how am I doing relative to that vision? 
and I realized I wasn't doing that well. Something was amiss, and I felt, I felt this really deeply, and I started thinking about, well, what is it I'm doing that's making me feel this way? It was a number of things, all sort of in the same genre, and I'm happy to share some examples. I just felt like, on the whole, I had the tendency to be scared, often scared. And not just scared, but often petty and small. I would, um, when it came to say, like, meeting someone for coffee or lunch, I found that I was almost solely interested in a business outcome. Hey, what can I get out of this person? And I legitimately meant it when I would say something like, what can I do for you? Sure, I would happily do something. But I really was waiting for them to say, what can I do for you, Barry? And I was like, oh, well, I got a list, and here's the list. Now, I really was solely interested in the transaction. And it wasn't, of course, just that, it was other things. I found that with friends, I had a tendency to effectively say mean things always couched in a joke. It was always a joke, or at least I had plausible deniability when it was a joke. But in fact, it was often very hurtful and mean. And that's sort of this wicked combination of just enough wit and just a sharp enough tongue that I could land something that was really good and devastating. I mean, I was really good at this. Um, but I found ultimately, in those moments when I'm thinking about this at 29, how, how deeply unproductive it was. And this is sort of my identity. This is who I was. I'm the guy that makes cutting remarks. And it's hilarious. Except it wasn't really hilarious. Now some of them were funny, but on the whole, they were not funny. And I, I started thinking to myself, well, if these things are not doing me any services, why do I do them? I sought, um, I sought credit for things. I desperately needed credit. We're at, you know, assigning credit around a room for whatever we're doing. I desperately needed to be identified. This is a core part of my need. Again, I was sort of both scared, needy, and reliant on so much sort of external stimuli to feel good. Those cutting remarks, it's a classic example of tearing someone down to just build yourself up. And those would be like 30 second wins, right? That's all it got me, because I needed to do it again to feel whole. At 29, I just, um, I knew these things were not working. And I knew they were not delivering results. And then, years later, I didn't know this at the time, I found that there's actually a name associated with a lot of this. I didn't know this until maybe I was 35. But the name is, it's, it's a scarcity mentality. Many of you probably heard it. Many of you maybe you had talks on it. I don't pretend to be an authority. I just read later about scarcity mentality. I'm like, oh, I, yeah, I've had that. I mean, I know what that is. And I knew so clearly it's what I had adopted for the better part of 10 or 12 or more years. If I'm 29 and realizing it, I've easily been doing it since high school. And a scarcity mentality is this mentality that everything is a zero-sum game. You have to fight for your, your prizes at the expense of other people. You can't really celebrate others. It's really narrowly about you and what you can extract from situations, how much you can win how much adulation you can receive. So by the way, this, uh, this picture is of uh, the Faroe Islands. It's a bit of an optical illusion, because you have the North Atlantic here, and you've got this lake up there, and it looks like the lake is way above sea level of the North Atlantic. Now that is actually true, but not by the degree to which it looks. This stone right here is about 100 meters high, and the lake sits about 30 meters above the North Atlantic. So it's not quite as high as the rock, 
though it deceivingly sort of looks that way. And it's incredible. When you're walking around here, Ryan actually asked me, I showed him this picture and he said, uh, where are all the people? And I'm like, they're not around. There's nobody there. Um, you hike from that village at the top, all through there, I think Jackie and I ran across more sheep than people by a huge margin. Like we ran across 10 people and like 50 sheep. Um, it was uh, tremendous. And by the way, none of this is roped off. This is an actual ledge you could just fall over into the North Atlantic. <laughs> all right, so when you realize at 29 years old that all of this behavior you've been doing is not working for you, what do you do? Well, you change, and you gotta just decide to change. And that's what I did. And if you're not gonna have a scarcity mentality, what do you have? I guess you could be like neutral. I don't know why you do that, because there's a better option. And that better option is called an abundance mentality. An abundance mentality is exactly what it sounds like. You stop believing that there are scarce amount of things for, for you in your life, and instead you start thinking about how abundant this life really is, and that there's more than enough for everyone, including yourself. So that's what I did. I just adopted an abundance mentality. I didn't know that's what it was called, but I decided, hey, listen, instead of ripping my friends, why don't I start praising them and like supporting them? I know this sounds really obvious. It wasn't at the time. It took me 29 years to get there. But once I got there, I'm like, oh, this is way better. I found a significant number of changes occurred for me when I changed my approach. More than anything, I became happy. I appreciated people more. I appreciated the moment way, way more. I, I found, among other things, that the biggest change for me was how I viewed networking. Now, who here loves the word networking? Anyone? No. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> I didn't think anyone liked the term networking because the word somehow gives us sort of like a weird feeling. It feels like it's a shitty word. But the act of networking is just connecting with people, right? So why are we so anti the word? Let's, let's get over the word for the moment. Put it on the shelf. We're gonna use the word networking because it's sort of what we know but we gotta get over our sort of distaste for it. So whereas before, I viewed every chance to meet somebody as an opportunity in business, I changed to just appreciating being around them. So networking is one of the only places in your life where you can clearly pick out someone you want to be friends with and then become friends with them. <laughs> I want you to think about that. You couldn't do that in high school, couldn't do it in college. After college, this is your chance. You can be like, that person's cool. I'd like to meet them. Hey, under the guise of business, let's go get coffee. <laughs> in all seriousness, I love networking. I love meeting people. I, I found I was deeply interested in learning about who these people were that I sat across from. My wife will probably make fun of me later for mentioning it this way, um, because she's told me privately uh, how silly this sounds. <laughs> My favorite networking opportunity is when I get to ask an hour or an hour and a half worth of questions to someone and just learn as much as I can about them. And like, I'm not trying to hide who I am. I'm just trying to learn as much as I can about them because what other opportunity do you have in your life to do this? You never get this chance. And it's like free territory to do this. And then in those moments, you get to develop this extraordinary empathy because you're learning about someone's experience that is not your experience. Because we all have obviously very different experiences. It's, it's actually a, it's a tremendous thing. I also stopped caring about business outcomes. 
completely. So, whereas before, again, I was hoping they'd be like, hey, what can I do for you? And I'd be like, hey, listen, uh, you know this guy over here, he's got a great business. We could really help with their legal work. Now, I'm like, yo, can you just introduce me to like the coolest people you know? Like, that's all I care about. And if someone in this room has been to breakfast or coffee or lunch with me, I literally say that. I'm not joking. I just want to meet cool people. Business can come. If you're in a position where you have to go to these meetings or lunches and you have a trained protocol you have to follow, knock that out. Do your job. And then just focus on the person. Just take the time and the energy to invest in this moment that you just so rarely get. It's unbelievable how good it is. And it's this only opportunity you really have in which you can just connect with someone for an hour in this very quiet way. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter whether it's lunch, dinner, coffee, it's just this one opportunity to actually connect on the most real of levels. All right. So, having realized I was lost for a long, long time, I'm gonna share through a participatory uh, thing, my process. Maybe it doesn't work for you. Maybe you're all like totally beyond me already, which is perfectly fine. In fact, great if that's the case. But maybe this could work for one of you. So we're gonna do this together. I ask you to close your eyes, get comfortable, close your eyes. I will walk you through this. All right. I'm gonna ask you to envision a space, a room. And it's a decent sized room. And in this room are people you know and people you don't know. And it could be any kind of event. It could be a wedding, a banquet, a charity event, work, doesn't matter. Now, you have not yet entered the room, so I want you to picture what the energy of that space looks like. What does it feel like in that room? What's the temperature? What's the cadence of the conversations? Okay, now, I want you to imagine the very best version of yourself. The one that you want to be. Now imagine that version of yourself walking into that room. What does it feel like when the best version of yourself walks into that room? How do you react to the space? How does the space react to you? How does the energy change? How's the room feel? Now, without opening your eyes and without judging yourself, I want you to think about what reality is like, the real version of you, when it walks in that What does it feel like? How does the energy change? All right, let's all open our eyes. Great work. So this was my process. I thought to myself, I have this vision. And by the way, the very best athletes in the world, they are using visioning for everything they're doing. From LeBron James to Tiger Woods, all they're doing is visioning out their work. It's the same tool we can use when thinking about how we want to proceed with our life. So, <laughs> fantastic. If that had happened when you had your eyes closed, some of you would be like, what the fuck? All right, you gotta ask yourself 
whether your experience matches the vision you have for yourself. And this is what I do. Find where there are places that are amiss. This is what I experienced 10 years ago. If there are discrepancies, identify them and figure out which areas you can make improvements. And then, decide to change where possible and look to friends you admire for ideas. I'll give you an example. When I was 29, one of the big struggles I had was how I used my network. When someone would ask me for a referral, for really any reason, I had to think long and hard whether I wanted to make that introduction. I thought to myself, I don't know, what have you done to deserve this introduction? I legitimately thought this. I also thought, well, if you guys like each other a lot, what happens to me? Like a 10 year old, pairing up like two of their friends from like church and like school and it's like, they can't play together, they'll cut me out. That's how I felt. <laughs> um, I realized that, that was stupid and it was not doing me any favors. Certainly not helping my friends either. And so what I did was I looked to friends that were doing this way better than me. Way better. And I just straight up copied them. Just wholesale ripped them off. Now I left the mannerisms behind. They could keep their own mannerisms. I'm not trying to become them. But I was like, they are way better than me at this. I'm just gonna copy what they're doing. You can do that too. Now again, leave the mannerisms, but everything else you can just wholesale borrow. It's phenomenal. And I found in doing this, great joy, great joy. Because if you've ever teed up friends from disparate parts of your universe, you know just how amazing that is when people become friends on your watch oftentimes. It's incredible, it's so powerful. It's this beautiful thing that you helped create. And so whereas before I was scared, constantly scared of my place in that universe, I just stopped caring. And it became joyful and beautiful and I loved every moment of it. All right, small bits of wisdom for me. Take them or leave them. Um, number one. You have to invest in relationships. It's kind of all that matters. Sometimes I say you gotta collect friends. Friends are way more important than clients. They really are. I don't know what kind of business everybody's in, but I presume many of you have to get a client base to make money with your firm or office, whatever it is. Stop caring about the transaction. The transactions will be there. The people are what matters. And I guarantee you, when you're older, having a crazy number of friends will be way more important than whether, you know, Larry delivered a new client to you. So concentrate on the people and not the transactions. Explore. You have to explore. And I don't mean something big. If you want to go big, great. Just explore. So if you just want to explore locally, go to the parks. Holiday Park, Marat Park, Eagle Creek, Fort Bend. If you have not been to each one of the four parks I just mentioned, get off your ass this weekend and go to them. They are amazing. Do you know how good our parks are? They're incredible. And if you want to go bigger, go to the state parks. We now have a national park in Indiana, and it's phenomenal too. Go out and explore. And if you want to go bigger, great. But like, you can just go local for free, and it's still phenomenal. And my final piece of advice is make choices. Sounds simple, right? You're gonna make choices today, no big deal. I'm actually saying make the big choices. 10 years ago, I did not know what the hell I was doing. And I just sort of like was meandering through the dark and somehow found a way to a better path. And I made choices that were deliberate, didn't really take a lot, I maybe sometimes had to remind myself about them, but generally speaking, I just made choices 
and got on a different path. You have that same opportunity every day. And one of those choices, I think oftentimes, the very best sort of version of it is to simply leave your baggage behind. You don't have to carry it with you. In fact, it's better off that you don't. I'm not saying it's easy all the time. It's really hard. Sometimes it needs help. You need help to get there. But you get to make a choice. We're adults. So if you can, if you are able, just leave the baggage behind. I hope through my experiences, maybe it will remind you of something that you got to do yourself having been lost before. And if nothing else, I have one more picture of my kids <laughs> that is pretty charming. So thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it.